Uh, my name is Vita Plume, and uh, I'm on the board of TSA. And I want to thank you all for attending uh, the symposium and for choosing the session and to be with us. I encourage you all to ask questions and provide comments, um, but please hold that until the end. You can write them out in the, in the question and answer button at the bottom, but we won't address them until the end of the entire session. If you're going to address a specific speaker, please put that in your question so that we can ask that speaker that question. I'm pleased um, to introduce Lynn Tinley, our next speaker. Um, Lynn is an independent researcher and adjunct professor of history at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. Lynn holds a PhD in American Studies from Emory University. Her primary research focuses on early American material culture with an emphasis on textiles, religion, and Southern history. Samplers and female education form an important component of her research. Lynn is the current editor of the TSA Symposium symposium proceedings. She is the person who makes sure that all of these presentations will be properly uploaded and accessible through the University of Nebraska libraries, um, which is an open resource um, that all researchers and scholars can look at. So Lynn is a very important part of the TSA team. So on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank her for this important contribution to TSA and the field. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine, an interior designer friend of mine, said to me recently, I love the way textiles so often tell a story. As a historian, I look at textiles as not only telling story, but also embodying stories that tell history. Indeed, textiles are history. Historic textiles, like so many historic objects, tell a broad story that ranges from topics such as religion and education to social and economic history. Today, I'll be focusing on the Roswell Manufacturing Company in Georgia's upcountry, the upper upcountry Piedmont region. Although hidden in the newly settled upcountry, far removed from plantation-based propagation of luxurious Sea Island cotton of the coastal low country, this endeavor was singularly important to the American cotton export market. After a brief overview, I'm going to focus on three broad topics, the people, the products and the places, emphasizing the unique and important nature of this venue that connected upcountry, low country, and global trade. Um, first, uh, the, an important point of context is that there are, are broadly two cotton, long staple cotton and short staple cotton. Long staple cotton, known as Sea Island cotton, is propagated in the low country, and that is not the kind of cotton that the Roswell factory worked with. They worked with short staple cotton cotton, which is grown in the upcountry into the Piedmont regions. It is less expensive to buy and sell. It can withstand a frost, and the seeds are very difficult to remove. So there are three factors that were critical to the success of this Roswell Mill um, venture. First was Whitney's improvement of the cotton gin in the late 18th century. Of course, the 18th century massive increase in the global demand for cotton, and the gradual improvement in local non-water transportation. Indeed, short staple cotton was, was an encouraging option for economic growth. So short staple cotton was the type of cotton that the Roswell Mill worked with. I want to now go to the main people who were responsible for this endeavor. The first and uh, the vision, the visionary of this was Roswell King. He was born in Connecticut. His father was an accomplished weaver. As a young man, he moved to Darien, Georgia on the coast in 1788. He initially built uh, plantation homes, and then, then he became the plantation manager for Pierce Butler, who owned several large plantations on the coast. King became a large landowner. He was a commission broker for cotton and, and as well as rice and lumber. He was active in local government and militia, and he was a director after he left the employee of Pierce Butler of the uh, Bank of Darien. So King was well-connected socially, he knew how to grow and sell cotton, and he had business and family connections in the North and the South. He went to North Georgia as an agent for the Bank of Darien in the 1820s, in the late 1820s, to search for opportunities for the bank. While he was there, he noticed that this was an, a good area for um, the uh, building of cotton manufacturing um, 
endeavor, which was virtually unprecedented at the time, which is the important thing to remember because cotton at this time was grown in the South, but as um, Jacqueline said a moment ago, generally shipped to the North for processing. And this was Cherokee territory at the time. But King realized the benefits. There was a healthy climate, particularly composed of the coastal climate, excellent water power, cheap labor, inexpensive food, cheap cotton, it's the short staple cotton, and a stable workforce because most of these people were very poor yeoman new settlers. So I wanted to give you a quick uh, overview of what we're talking about here. On the map to the left, the, low, the arrow to the lower right is where Darien is along the coast. The area on the upper left is where Roswell is in the upper Piedmont region. And if you look at the map to the right, you'll notice inside those dotted lines is the Piedmont region. So, and the important thing about this is the water power, it's critical. And the water power is a result of the formation of the fall line. And the fall line in Georgia goes from Columbus to Macon to Augusta. So King returned to what was called at the time Lebanon, the Lebanon area with his son Barrington King around 1830 to explore the possibilities for a mill and a factory. He acquired land in 1835 that had been acquired only three years earlier in the Cherokee uh, Land Society Treaty, land lottery, and he started construction in 1837. This briefly, I want to show you again how unsettled and how unique this was. Cobb County, which is in the upper left hand corner of the map on the left, had, had only been established in 1832, as I had said before from Cherokee land. It was being quickly settled by yeoman farmers who were basically subsistence farmers who would often grow cotton as a cash crop. And on the right, I just want you to see, this is a map of the uh, uh, Indian land treaties. So the point to remember here is that this land, even though it was upcountry and it was settled, um, it was still familiar to the people of Georgia and clearly South Carolina, Virginia, who quickly populated it. So the imagine, imagine the vision it took to risk families and money to create a manufacturing factory in this land at this time. King convinced five other wealthy coastal families to move there, but he also convinced a man by the name of Henry Merrill to come manage his him. Henry Merrill was from Utica, New York. He was related to the King and the Smith families. Archibald Smith family was one of those who moved to the region with the Kings. And Merrill worked at the Oneida Cotton Factory outside of Utica, New York. In 1838, King asked him to move to Georgia to manage his factory. King uh, Merrill, before coming down, arranged for the purchase of weaving equipment from the firm of Rogers, Ketchum, and Grosvenor in Patterson, New Jersey. Merrill was familiar with, with Thomas Rogers and was very, um, had a high regard for his weaving equipment. And Patterson, New Jersey is a hotbed of weaving and of uh, machinery building at the time. So uh, Merrill bought this equipment for King and traveled with it actually um, from New York to Savannah and indeed then brought it up to Roswell. So another example of um, the people who are really important to this endeavor were the many unknown, unknown yeoman farmers who grew the cotton and, and um, also many of them worked in the mill. This is a picture of Maddie Hembry House. Maddie's uh, father, Elihu, came to the area in the 1830s from South Carolina and the House family came at the same point in time. These were very early settlers of the region. And I actually see their, both of their names in the cotton books, we'll get, which we'll get to in a minute. So these uh, yeoman farmers were increasingly growing short staple cotton as a cash, cash crop, particularly because they could take it to the Roswell Manufacturing Company. And what I want to note also is that although not pictured, the virtually, there's a virtually hidden and very important group who worked in the factories and many of whom lived in the mill town that was built by King and the Marietta uh, and the um, Roswell Manufacturing Company. I wanted to show this picture briefly because it shows kind of the excitement, although it's circa 1900, around the harvesting of cotton. This is a group of um, farmers with their bales of cotton that have already been ginned, ready to be delivered. And this is a map of the mill, uh, an image of the mill pre-Civil War. So the mill was built along Vickery Creek, which is just, which feeds the Chattahoochee River. It's north of 
current day Atlanta. In 1838, this compound consisted of a cotton mill, a sawmill, a woolen mill, a flour mill, which had actually pre-existed in Lebanon, and a brick kiln. Uh, King built a brick story building. It was 40 feet square. The first floor was a weaving room. Second floor was a spinning room. The third floor was carting and picking rooms. The attic at that point in time was intended for mules. Came in 1840. In 1839, right after he he built this first mill, he added a two-story wing with eight looms and almost 1,200 spindles. In 1839, it had a, the mill had a capacity of 2,000 pounds of yarn per day from five bales of cotton. In 1846, they added a wool factory. In 1852, they added a grist mill. In 1854, they added a second cotton factory. In 1857, Barrington King's sons, James and Thomas, built Ivy Woolen Mill, which was down the creek, if you will, Vickery Creek from the, this Roswell mill. And by 1861, they had warping mills. And according to a family letter in the archives at the History Center, uh, Roswell Manufacturing Company was sending warps as far away as Philadelphia, although they weren't sizing the warps. And they were also providing warp threads to the woolen mill that was down the creek. In 1872, they added 116 looms. And in 1874, they added four check looms and a dye works. Now, it's important remember that all of the goods that were being produced here were what would be considered coarse goods. Indeed, all of the goods produced in Georgia and in the South were coarse goods. They can be described as coarse and plain and included yarns and twines, sheeting and shirting, jeans, Osnabergs, and twills. And in quick context, before 1820, mill endeavors were short-lived and had failed. And prior to Roswell Manufacturing Company, only two had been successful. Uh, the Georgia factory in Athens had been established in 1829, and the Richmond factory in Augusta had been established in 1834. And those of you remember all along the fall line, they're using water power. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the products that were being um, brought into the mill and then being produced by the mill. So we have cotton receipt books from the mill. I wanted to share with you this from March 13th and the 20th of 1863 to give you an idea of what it looked like when it was coming in. So the top half of this page is from the 13th. And you'll notice that the F with the V below it, the GL, the O, the JN with an underline M, and then below that GL again are marks for people who are bringing in cotton. So that day, if you look at the middle of that indication, 22 bales of cotton BC were brought in that weighed 11,341 pounds. And if you were to add up all of those individual weights of each bale, they totaled 11,341 pounds. The interesting thing about this, this entry is you'll notice in the middle, it says no mark. So it wasn't uncommon for a cotton to come into the mill with no mark. I presume they knew who, who it belonged to at that point in time. And then on the, the bottom, you'll see again the marks on the 20th. But what I wanted to point out there was the RP up next to the 20th. And then the RP in the middle of that indication are different marks. Uh, the one in the middle is more of an italicized version. And the other thing, if you look on the left of that near the bottom, the F with the underline brought in one bale of what it says bad cotton. But that bad cotton was included in that 22 bales of cotton for the day. Anyway, this is May 20th of 1863, and the top and the bottom entries are pretty, pretty average. The one I want to note in the middle entry is that if you look to the left, it says Dunwoody, and there are two marks with one bale each having been received with a squiggle, and those are not included in that 14 bales of cotton for that day. So the Dunwoody family were one of those families who came to the region with King from the coast, and they were uh, on the board and prominent, and for some reason, I don't, I don't know, I'll, looking, that's one of the things I'm looking into if he took it, or I don't know, but that was not entered into the receipts for the day. Well, I have not been able to associate these marks with families, that's one of the things I'm working working on. Sometimes records indicate that a receipt was going to the seed house. Sometimes records indicate that cotton was brought by someone for someone else. And sometimes records indicate that cotton came from a depot or an agent associated with a particular mark. 
So the following pages I'm going to show you are occasionally randomly interspersed between the other pages. And they indicate um, usually smaller amounts of cotton that are being sold either for or cash or in yarn. The top entry that I'm showing you is a detail of the page to the left. And the thing that's really curious about that is there are four regular bales of cotton. Bales of cotton are between like 450 pounds and 500 pounds. And if you'll look, the two of them are associated with a mark and they're all being paid in yarn, which you see to the bottom right of that detail. But then in these other two, the thing I like about that is they're showing women bringing cotton in. The fourth entry down on the left, Mrs. Jackson brought in 48 pounds and she was, the entry says 48 at 20. So she was getting 20 cents per pound for that yarn. And so she was paid for $9.60 worth of yarn. Because if you look at to the right of the number 20, you'll notice that it says in yarn. The one on the right has two entries for women. The very top is Mrs. Thompson, and she is receiving 20 cents a pound for 60 pounds and 40 cents a pound for two pounds in cash. And you can see that it says cash on an entry. Two entries down is really nice because it says Mrs. Doris. She's also receiving 40 cents a pound for some yarn. But um, the thing about that is that family was there before the Indian Treaty, the Cherokee Treaty, and they had a trading post and traded with white settlers and Indians. And indeed, James Norris married a Cherokee woman for his wife. So these records give you a glimpse, a small glimpse, albeit, at the participation that women had in this um, trade. This is a book from a later period, 1877. And what I wanted you to note here is that by now there sometimes is indicating where the cotton is coming from. And, and um, without a doubt, it's coming from north and northwest of Roswell. And he, Merritt, clearly brought in um, bales of cotton for someone with a mark of B. Um, and generally in this period of time, they're re receiving nine and a half to send tenths per pound of cotton. So I mentioned earlier that the mill was, um, that, that the Roswell Manufacturing Company yarn associated with coarse and plain goods. I want to give you a quick idea of what we're talking about. This is an image of coarse cotton that would have been in use for clothing. And this is an apron. It would have been hardworking cotton that would have been intended to be worn uh, for work. Um, another interesting example is this piece because it was, it's in the Roswell Historical Society collection and the session work says it was from homegrown, homespun and home hand woven cotton from the Hembry family again. Um, it's possible that they had actually given the yarn to the, to the mill to spin for them, but who knows. But the neat thing about this is that it was refashioned. It was originally a sheet and was refashioned to be a Sunday dress uh, during the depression. I wanted to quickly, quickly um, go through here to say that although the mill was receiving white cotton, in this area they were also uh, growing and yellow cotton and the men's shirt to the left and the woman's dress in the middle were woven from local brown and yellow cotton and then the green was white cotton that had been dyed in indica. Very interesting. So here's, I wanted to give you an idea of the yarn. So these are from the factory when it closed in the 70s. The, from, eight, from board meeting minutes, the mill was producing yarns from sizes 8 to 21 all coarse, but yarns number eight to number 21. And they were spinning and they were um, sending it to Savannah through the records. You can see that the yarn was, a lot of it was going to Savannah. And their cloths, and this is an example of the, the smaller, the um, smaller yarn that would have been spun. And I have two examples. Again, these are from the 1970s from the mill, but you can see the coarse nature of the cloth. The uh, company was producing four, four and seven eighths goods as they call it. Um, and uh, it's often referred to as four, four and seven eighths sheeting. They're refers to the width of the, of the cloth, uh, one fourth being nine inches. So four, four cloth is 36 inches wide and seven eighths cloth is 31 and a half inches wide. And then I mentioned 
imagine in 1877, they had a dyno. In uh, seven months at the end of 1877, they had produced 31,289 yards of stripes and 19,839 yards of checks. Wanted to briefly show you that I mentioned the ivy mills because we have an interesting piece from them. This is one of their labels, indicates that they're producing kerseys, jeans, and cassinets. All are cotton and wool blends. And uh, this is an actual product of the cloth from that from the Ivy Mill. It is from the Confederate military coat of Nathaniel Pratt, whose father was one of the original um, settlers of Roswell with King. And this will show you, this is in the collection of Atlanta Historical Society. You can see the cotton uh, warp th threads and the um, wool weft threads there. Now, I briefly want to quickly want to go into where this stuff was going. This is a copy of a letter, okay, I'll hurry, from 1847 that's in the records. They're trading cotton to New York and Baltimore. And what this letter is indicating that it's, it is being transported via the South Carolina Railroad. William F. Mott was in New York. He was had a dry goods cons commission company, and they're selling... Roswell is selling to Mott bales of yarn, bales of cotton floss, bales of cotton and bales of rope. And William um, Woodward was again a Baltimore and New York cotton merchant. They're selling bales of warp yarn, bales of cotton yarn and bales of rope. And so then we know that through correspondence, there's shipping to, to Savannah. And one of the agents they use is this N.A. Hardy and who are there in Savannah. And this is just a broadsheet for the company. And so, time, okay, they're going through Savannah. Savannah's going to England. And uh, I'll sum this up with a lot of stones need to be found and, and turned over to determine the direct link between upcountry Roswell and the international trade of cotton. What is certain is that what started as a risky vision in a newly created settlement had an important impact on the South and made an unprecedented contribution to global trade of cotton. Thank you. I'm so pleased to introduce our next speaker, Peggy Hart. Peggy's a production weaver and teacher who designs, produces, and markets hundreds of blankets each year, including custom blankets for sheep and alpaca farmers using their own yarn. She attended the Rhode Island School of Design, worked as a weaver in one of the last mills in Rhode Island, and has woven for the last 30 years on Crompton and Knowles W3 Looms. She has a special affinity for wool and her book, Wool, Unraveling an American Story of Artists and Innovation, was published in December of 2017. Welcome, Peggy. Um, th thanks to Lynn for introducing the word um, casinet because I'll be talking about that later. And I have to say, I'm thoroughly enjoying this virtual symposium, but I, I just want to note the irony of virtual textiles because textiles are like the most tactile of all materials. And in a typical top talk, I would be passing around samples so that people could touch them and see them and, and get a better idea of what they actually were. In the 19th century, Casimir was one of the most produced woolen fabrics in American mills. Casimir is much in evidence in census reports of wool manufacture from 1837 to the early 1900s. It appears in Cole's Complete Dictionary of Dry Goods in 1890. Quote, Casimir is a general term applied to that class of all wool cloths used for men's clothing, woven either plain or twilled, coarse or fine, of wool and yarn. The pattern of Casimir is always woven plain and distinct, and the cloth is never napped. Casimir appears early in the 20th century in the Thomas Register of American Manufacturer Buyer's Guide of 1905-1906 under wool and goods after whistles, wigs, and witch hazel. And the register lists at least 101 mills making Casimir. And I'm showing you this map of Massachusetts. Um, it's, also, it's also 1906. And every town that is listed on this map had a mill in it. And no, they weren't all woolen mills. There were cotton mills as well, but just to get you an, a sense of the density of mills in Massachusetts. In 1914,
Casimir is listed in Bennett's Woolen and Worsted Fabrics Glossary. But in later 20th century fabric reference books, it disappears. Or if you find it, as in the 1960 American Fabrics Encyclopedia of Textiles, it's described as a hardware and cloth made of worsted yarn. Similarly, in the 1967 Dan River Mills Dictionary, it's defined as worsted suiting. And one more book that shows um, Casimir and the weave structure and a swatch. Confusion abounds around the etymology of the word Casimir, but the 19th century fabric was described as a lightweight woolen fabric twilled and not mat napped. It was woven with fine woolen singles yarn by woolen mills that procured the mill, procured the wool, often locally, washed, carded, spun, and finally wove it. It was woven with at least four shafts or harnesses. The minimal finishing, washing but no napping or shearing, distinguishes it from both broadcloth and flannel, the other common woolen cloths of the 19th century. Casimir first appeared as a simple 2-2 two -two twill in 18th century England, and the top part of the cloth here is that 2-2 two -two twill. And for people that aren't weavers, um, a 2-2 two -two twill means that the weft yarn goes over two, under two, and then the next pick it moves over one, two, and so forth to create that diagonal line. Uh, so Casimir first appears as a simple two-two twill in 18th century England, patented and named by Francis Yerbury in 1766. The twill was not new, but the weight was. His stated goal was to quote, make thin, super fine cloth for the summer season at home and warmer climates abroad, end quote. In the patent application, he notes, quote, two species of my thin cloth distinguished by the name of casimers. One is quilled in the weaving with a flat whale, the other with a round one. Following his patenting, casimir production took off in the west of England. Yerbury specified in his patent that the same yarns be used for warp and weft of a thinness he described as super fine, also that Spanish wool or merino be used. It was probably not a coincidence that when Yerbury first patented his invention, Hargreaves spinning jenny had just been invented in the same area. The spinning jenny was a multiplication of wool wheel spindles mounted on a carriage that went back and forth to most more efficiently accomplish the tasks of the spinner, drawing the wool thinner and then twisting it. So I went down the rabbit hole of etymological speculation and um, found Casimir may derive from the place name of Kashmir. From there and from association with the fine wool of Kashmir goats, the word makes a series of leaps or corruptions to end a Casimir. Along the way, as in Denny's 1928 definition of fabrics, fine Kashmir goat fiber becomes associated with fine Spanish merino wool. Denny writes in her just definition of cas cashmere, originally meant fine wool of cashmere goat used in cashmere shawls of India. Some modern fabrics employ genuine cashmere wool and two, a lightweight dress fabric similar to Henrietta. Woolen cloths produced in Kersey, England perhaps introduced the twill structure and further muddied the entomology as Kersey mirror, another place name association and cash Kashmir mushed together. So you get to Casimir or Kaz, Kaz, Casimir. Casimir was woven in the US along with other cloth of British origin such as broadcloth and flannel. Bronson, author of the domestic manufacturer's assistant published in 1817 included a draft for Casimir. As with other fabric descriptions, he included specification for yarn, five run or a singles of the 8,000 yards per pound, set at 40 to 50 ends per inch. It was also known as cashmere, as in this weaver's draft book now in the winter tour collection. And um, this is a four shaft weave. Um, and you can see the twill line going off to the left. Casimir production, as with other woolens, was aided by the introduction of the merino in the early 1800s, as Casimir required medium to fine grade wool. To put 
Casimir in the context of American textile manufacturing history, the following appeared in an article about the woolen industry in the New York Times in 1865. Quote, if we may resort to the stage for a metaphor and depict broadcloth, dark, heavy, sumptuous as a tragedy of manufacture and Casimir, varied, diverse, brilliant as its comedy, nothing remains but to describe the satinette. I spoke about satinette at the last symposium. It was a fabric with a cotton warp and wool weft widely manufactured in the early to, to mid 1800s. However, as both power loom design evolved and domestic wool became more widely available, many early mills making satinette switched over to Casimir production in the 1850s. Casimir came to be one of the most produced woolen fabrics in American mills with the introduction of fancy fancy casimir and increased fashion possibilities. And um, in 1840, Mr. Samuel Lawrence, agent of the Middlesex Mills of Lowell, had an American visitor. Mr. Lawrence said, quote, he had an overcoat woven in diamond figures of great beauty, said he saw it at an exhibition at Paris. Bonjean and son of Sedan were the manufacturers. He gave me a small bit from the inside of the collar, unquote. John Hayes, American wool industry chronicler in Fleece and the Loom, credits Bonjean with the first can fancy Casimir around this time. And just playing around, I wove a couple of um, small diamond figures that could have been inside that coat collar. In 1836, William Crompton invented a power loom with a patterning device, a dobby head and chain. Bonjean's diamond was the inspiration for Mr. Lawrence to invite William Crompton to bring his loom to the Middlesex Mill in Lowell, Massachusetts, to attempt to produce something similar. Up until the invention of the fancy loom, the predominant woolen cloth produced was satinette. Crompton's loom had one shuttle, but in 1857, Lucius Knowles, Crompton's main rival and future partner, developed drop boxes, a means of running more than one shuttle. And um, this is a 19, 1850s loom. And you can see on the, um, on the sides of where the shuttle race is, you can see boxes. And these are those drop boxes that could hold one, more than one shuttle. Having more than one shuttle enabled color patterning as well as weave structure, including checks. The Massachusetts Census of Manufacturers data shows that a shift to Casimir's began from the invention of the Crompton loom. William Bagnall, chronicler of the early textile industry, pro profiled a handful of manufacturers in five textile manufacturing states. He wrote of James Eddy, who began, who made satinettes beginning in 1824 in Fall River, Massachusetts, but began making Casimir's in 1843. He writes, quote, in 1843, in common with many other manufacturers of satinets, the firm began to make fancy casimirs, fabrics the manufacture of which was introduced in this country in 1839 in the Middlesex Mills of Lowell, Massachusetts." Unquote. He also wrote about the Wheelock's woolen mills in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, who first wove satinette in 1846, but switched to fancy casimirs. These fabrics have been introduced extensively into the woolen mills throughout the country, which had been previously engaged in the manufacture of satinettes until they have nearly superseded that no longer popular fabric for men's clothing. From the years 1845 to 1865, the production of Casimir's increased fivefold, especially in response to its use in Civil War uniforms. Textile designers developed many variations patterns being published in industry publications such as Manufacturer's Wealth and Fiber and Fabric. Var variation, and this is, a, um, this, this is a page from that Fiber and Fabric issue. And you can see at the top, it says Casimir weaves, and these are drafts for um, fancy Casimirs. Variations included backed casimirs, double casimirs, diamond casimirs, Harris's double and twist casimir using plied yarn in the warp, casimirs requiring anywhere from eight to 32 shafts. Fancy casimir also included color effects such as pinwheel, houndstooth, and log cabin. Because it was not napped, the weave structure and the color patterning showed clearly. Um, 
Casimir became a staple woolen fabric for men's and boys' suitings, but also women's dress goods, as shown in, um, I, in this 1860 issue of Godey's Ladies Book. And to the side, it says, it can be made of cashmere, merino, or, or cloth. So it, that's a little bit um, vague there. And they could have been talking about actual cashmere cloth made of um, from cashmere goats, or they could have been using the commonly, um, the common term of cashmere, which even the mills called it. And here are some ads for um, some of the men's and boys suiting. This is from the early 20th century. Um, this ad is from the late 1900s. And you can see just by the price of the suits, um, the, the suits were only $3.25 in this ad. And in the previous ad, they were almost $20. And um, these, um, Sample pages actually showed pieces of the fabric that um, you could get your pants made out of. The Appleton fabrics were manufactured in Wisconsin. And while these are not identified um, specifically as Casimir, I believe they are Casimir in that they fit the um, criteria of being twill weave structures and of a certain weight and singles wool. Most of the mills were clustered in Rhode Island, Massachusetts and Connecticut, Connecticut and New Jersey. But as I said, this one's, this is from Wisconsin. Um, this is a shot from the Taconic Mill in North Adams, Massachusetts, um, early 20th century. And here's an ad for a Casimir factory in Kentucky. Casinet, a cheaper version using a cotton warp, was also produced during the 19th century. It was much like satinette, except that instead of using a satin weave, it was woven with a twill. And as um, Lynn said, it, this fabric was used in Civil War uniforms. Casinet was also mentioned in several British publications, the first being The Economist and General Advisor in 1824. Whether it caught on in England is not known, but it appears in the New England Mercantile Directory in 1849 as cashmere manufactured by mills in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So again, you know, the names are just all over the place. Casinet, cashmere, cashmere, casimir. Um, Casinet later shows up in the hearings of a committee investigating the Iowa Reform School in 1879 the prison tailor was being questioned regarding his work. In answer to a query about his manufacture of turnout suits, he confirmed that he used cheap stuff, jeans, casinet, and satinette for making prisoners closed. When worsted combing and spinning machinery became available in the 1880s and the production of worsted cloth overtook woolen, casimir weaves were appropriated for worsted fabrics with the result that casimir came to be defined as a worsted fabric, as in those um, definitions I read to you at the beginning. However, decades of inventiveness and the resulting trove of casimir weave structures are still used by contemporary designers, and casimir continues to be woven, though its name has been lost. Where can you find it today? These lightweight woolen fabrics were a perfect weight for recycling into wool quilts, as in this quilt owned by the um, Vermont Historical Society, made of fabric swatches from um, a woolen mill in Vermont. Here's another quilt. This came from um, manufacturer samples uh, from the Gilbert Manufacturing Company in Hardwick, Massachusetts. Uh, so wool quilts and also braided and hooked rugs. And here's, here's a little piece of casimir being cut up for a hooked rug. Civil War reenactor sites offer reproduction casimir fabric for sale, or you can check with your local fiber shed to see if they are weaving some, bringing it back to full circle to local wools, local mills. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody about fiber shed um, but this is some Casimir that we are making in my area. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Emily Winter. Emily is a weaver based in Chicago. She is co-founder of The Weaving Mill, an experimental weaving studio that blends design, fine art, textile education, and research-based practice in the context of a repurposed textile manufacturing facility. It's housed in a day program for adults with developmental disabilities. She has an MFA in textiles from the Rhode Island School of Design and a BA in history from the University of Chicago. Emily, it's lovely to have you with us here today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everybody for joining us. It's so exciting to scroll through the list. It feels very powerful. Scroll through the list of attendees and see who's here. Anyway, thank you all for joining us so much. And thank you to um, Jacqueline, Lynn, and Peggy for sharing these presentations today. It's a lot to, a lot to take in. Um, so today I'm going to be sharing with you a work in progress. I started this project in 2019 with support from the Center for Craft, and the research and the fieldwork have been unfolding over the last year and a half. COVID-19 has had a major impact on the development of this project, um, but more importantly on the subject matter itself. The Navajo Nation, as I'm sure many of you know, has been incredibly hard hit by the virus with some of the nation's highest infection rates, a crisis compounded by lack of access to running water, high poverty rates, and a dispersed access to healthcare, all of which is the result of the reservation settler colonial history and present, which is you know, a big, big part of the sort of narrative arc of this particular story. Um, the domestic wool industry all but shut down entirely from March to September of this year, essentially freezing many producers and businesses um, up until basically you know, a month or so ago. And so sorting out the implications of this crisis and then also people's responses to it has become a part of this project. Today, however, I'm really going to focus on the pre-pandemic moment and also the frames through which I'm approaching this project. And I look forward to continuing to share this work as it sort of unfolds and takes shape in the coming months. So I'm going to be speaking with you today about wool, specifically wool that originates in the Navajo Nation that I've been weaving with for several years. I'll be following the wool for a short portion of the supply chain of its travels, beginning with its initial, initial purchase on the 2019 wool buy. In this project, I'm looking for ways of using images, narrative, and historical context to tie people, landscapes, and histories to physical material. As a weaver who makes and sells textiles from wool connected to the supply chain, and as someone who's invested in the practice of unpacking some of the forms of capitalist exchange which shape the way we relate to objects, I have a vested interest in finding methods for describing these supply chains that transcends marketing rhetoric. So the notion of transparency or traceability has become really ubiquitous in the last several years. And I would argue that at times that sort of that rhetoric can obscure more than it actually reveals. That the act of sort of mapping material movement or naming suppliers doesn't actually tell us very much at all about sort of the political, environmental or social implications of material or production choices. And at times, in fact, that sort of there's sort of a seductiveness of like the rationality of that kind of um, mapping that can sort of alienate people further from the processes that go into making things and also from sort of the history of objects that can become disappear that can be disappeared, excuse me. And so to say it another way, my hope with this project is to offer a model to which we might begin to articulate the relationships of history, labor, power, and landscape to the textiles that we live with and make. And to say it another way, a blanket is never just a blanket, which I think is something we all, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Of course, it's never just a blanket, um, but all of these histories, people and places and processes are present in the material itself. And so figuring out ways to communicate that and sort of um, make these narratives and these processes sort of present in the objects themselves. So for me, one of the guiding frames in this project um, comes from Peter Stallybrass, um, his essay, Marx's Coat, which is a really, really wonderful essay. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it, um, which is a really a meditation on Karl Marx, the pawn shop, commodity fetishism, and the lived sort of implications of textiles. In the essay, Stallybrass uses the concept of the fetish, both in Marx's formulation of the commodity fetish and also in the earlier colonial usage to demonstrate sort of what's at stake in the embodied lives of objects. 
and a quote from Sally Brass here, what was demonized in the concept of the fetish was the possibility that history, memory, and desire might be materialized in objects that are touched and loved and worn. And so this possibility was so dangerous for the ways in which it challenged the perceived autonomy of the individual, that physical sort of inanimate objects could have power over individuals, could have lives of their own, could sort of impact the way that people relate to one another. And so it's sort of through the lens of industrial capitalism, objects achieve their true meaning or value only in the process of exchange. And so through a conversion of exchange, of sort of exchanging a material, physical material for another good, sort of putting it into the terms of dollar value, um, that that sort of form of equivalence is an object sort of highest, highest achievement. And this sort of process of exchange is precisely what erases the specificity of history and material and people and labor and places and all of these things. Um, all of these sort of things that create the embodied object. And so this sort of exchange process, which turns things from specific embodied historical things into these really ahistorical and generalized mm -hmm. abstractions, um, is kind of at the heart of how capitalist production functions and how it alienates people from their own labor. And in this case, I would argue as importantly, how it alienates people from the materials and textiles that surround them. And so this I think really sums up what we're sort of up against. Um, this quote from Stally Brass that it has become a cliche to say that we should not treat people like things, but it is a cliche that misses the point. What have we done to things to have such contempt for them? And who can afford to have such contempt? And so I'm now gonna segue very abruptly into the sort of um, the meat of the wool by having given us a few frames through which hopefully to think about sort of what I'm gonna be talking about. So I've been hearing about this wool buy for several years from my friend Teddy, who's an independent wool broker here in Chicago. He produces restoration yarns with Navajo raised wool and mohair. And in working with the wool, producing blankets, um, some apparel items, scarves, rugs, I was sort of consistently surprised to find what seemed to be a truly traceable material, like at a semi-industrial scale. Um, so I think that sort of true traceability is a lot more achievable when you're working at sort of the more localized fiber shed scale. But when you sort of step up a little bit, it becomes a more challenging to really meaningfully engage with the supply chains and sort of figure out where your materials come from and understand the processes by which they get to you, or to, in, in this case, to me, to my studio. So the wool buy itself takes place in mid-June. Over the course of a week, a crew of commercial wool buyers and volunteers crisscross the Navajo Nation, buying wool from Diné producers. Okay, so sheep have been an integral part of Diné culture for centuries, and both the sale and export of raw wool, as well as woven textiles, has been a major element of economic activity between Diné and Anglos throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So the wool buy started in 2012. Roberto Nut Lewis from the Black Mesa Water Coalition, which is a Navajo Hopi environmental justice organization founded in 2001, invited Stanley Strode from the Mid-States Wool Growers Cooperative to come out to the reservation to buy wool. Black Mesa was working on an, an initiative called the Navajo Wool Market Improvement Project designed to create better marketing opportunities for Navajo raised wool. As it stood, the main option for folks to sell their wool on the reservation was at trading posts or border town livestock depots, which paid a nominal five or 10 cents a pound, regardless of the type or quality of wool. These prices weren't tied in any way to the labor of raising the wool, nor to the going prices in the broader off-reservation wool market. And so these trading posts and livestock depots generally were just sort of, you know, buying from individual producers and then they, they're just acting as middlemen. So they were then selling to sort of whoever's next down the chain. So in 2012, Roberto from Black Mesa set up the first buy in Pinon, Arizona, and Stanley came out from Ohio and purchased about 12,000 pounds of wool that first year. He came back the next year, this time visiting a few more towns, buying more wool. And in the following years, buyers from Peace Fleece joined the caravan as well as Mr. Varndell buying mohair. And by 2019, the wool buy was really um, this full-fledged sort of institution. Uh, with a you know, week-long itinerary and really established partnerships with Black Mesa Water Coalition, as well as the Diné College Land Grant Office, which is the agriculture, agricultural extension program of the Diné College in Salie. So the buy itself is, is repetitive. Every day we pull up to the location, usually a rodeo ground or chapter house parking lot. 
around 7.30 a.m. and we'd be greeted by a line of cars, sometimes 40 to 60 deep, each loaded with wool. We'd set up the tent, the scales, the folding table, the bag stands, and start moving people through. The sellers came from all over the Navajo Nation, with loads ranging in size from a few fleeces, 40-odd pounds, wrapped in bed sheets or a handful of trash bags, to um, much larger loads, a couple hundred pounds from a large flock, um, packed in burlap wool bags. And we're really seeing like a wide range of type and quality of both sheep wool and mohair. So all of this wool was weighed, graded, and priced by the buyers, unloaded from its various packaging and repacked into wool bags to get loaded onto the trucks. And the rebagging was really a major part of the wool buy. So by consolidating all the wool that came in in sort of independent packaging, um, by consolidating into these larger plastic wool bags, uh, the buyers were able to fit an extra like two to 3,000 pounds on each truck, um, making the freight costs, of course, more efficient. And so it was in many ways actually like the main labor activity of the wool by itself was this sort of like re basically unpacking and repacking. And so I want to spend a minute with it um, because I think that it sort of drives home a point about sort of like transformation, like material transformation, like writ small versus trans material transformation writ large. And I think we're all sort of familiar with a lot of the sort of the writ large processes, right? It's like shearing, um, scouring, carding, combing, spinning, weaving, right? All of these sort of capital letter transformations. But I think that the, you know, these elements are these sort of in, in many ways more invisible sort of practices of material transformation which are just just as an integral to the process of creating an object um, are worth spending a little bit of time observing and also just because they do in fact take up so much time and so another sort of thing that i want to note here is that sort of all the material all the sort of movement of material that i'm talking about today which is just one short portion of the supply chain is um it's sort of what I've come to understand as like sort of a preparatory stage of material production. And so like when wool prices are talked about in like the sort of global commodity market, it's always talked about in terms of clean wool. And so there's all of these many, many, many steps and movements that happen before the wool even becomes sort of like legible um, in a like sort of global or financial sense. And so if we only talk about it sort of starting from that point where it like has a price, um, we lose all of sort of all the sort of specificity that I'm showing you guys today, all of that sort of gets erased. So anyway, so by the end of the week, we've traveled around the Navajo Nation, visited these nine different towns and purchased over 160,000 pounds of wool and sent it back to Ohio, which just a quick visual, that's about six and a half 50 foot trucks, all packed absolutely to the gills and then shipped to Ohio. So all of this wool, as I said, is getting shipped to the Mid-States Wool Growers Cooperative Warehouse, which is in Canal Winchester, just outside of Columbus, Ohio. Um, they're a commercial wool broker, wool buyer and seller. They've been around since 1918. And at their core, they operate on this cooperative model in which individual producers pool their wool together. So ranchers and farmers of all scales and from all over the country um, give their wool to consignment to mid-states or on consignment to mid-states who then sells it primarily to um, this scouring plant in South Carolina. And so by pooling the wool, smaller individual producers are able to sort of, you know, tack onto larger lots and get better prices for all for their wool than they could on their own and basically access a market that they wouldn't be able to access as, indi as individuals. And most of the wool that's coming in from the Navajo buy is not on consignment, it's purchased outright. Um, because the logistics of managing that consignment, I think would be overly unwieldy. Um, so as domestic wool production has shrunk over the last century, we can see that this is a graph showing us the number of head of sheep shorn nationally in the last hundred or so years, that you know, from a sort of average around 45 million head leading up to World War II, we've dropped to less than three and a half million in this past year. So as this change has happened over the last century, Mid-States, of course, has had to sort of shift their business model. And so that sort of explains in some way the connection between Mid-States and the Navajo wool buy that they've had, you know, 30 years ago, they were able to sort of reach their desired volume 
by purchasing from states sort of, you know, in the Ohio area. And now the wool production is so dispersed and so much smaller that they have to really expand their territory to hit the volume that they, um, that they need to continue as a business. And so today, Mid-States moves about 1.3 million pounds of wool through their warehouse annually. And so the Navajo clip from this past year made up about 12% of that volume. So it's actually a not insignificant portion of sort of the ecosystem of Mid-States as a wool broker. And so when wool arrives at Mid-States, it comes in on the receiving end, it's unpacked, and then it goes up to the grading stand. So much of what Mid-States really does, and again, this goes back to the idea of sort of these like preparatory stages, um, it's really, they're, an, or they're like an organizing facility. So they're unpacking wool, they're grading it, and then they're repacking it, and they're sorting it. So I'm gonna show us just a short video sort of demonstrating a little bit of the mechanics of the grading process here. So here we have the wool coming up the conveyor belt to the grading stand. And this is Clayton, who's grader in training at Mid-States. And he is investigating fleece by fleece. And you'll see he's plucking it, testing it, looking at it. And so each of these, and so you can see that grading is very much a subjective process, very much a question of feel and experience and kind of understanding sort of, you know, with, with one's hands what they're looking for. And so as the wool is getting graded, it's getting dropped into these little baskets, which are sort of tags to a certain grade. And then they're gonna travel the perimeter of the warehouse here. And um, based on whatever grade Clayton's assigned to the wool, they're going to trip over the correct bay. And so as the baskets then trip, they drop into the bay and um, this will then get bailed and then sent out to mid-states, or sorry, to chargeres. And so when we're talking about grade, it's really a matter of sort of these different qualities of the wool, right? Sort of the diameter, the micron, the crimp, the color, the sort of level of contamination. And so most of the wool that's coming in from the wool buy is a medium grade. Uh, so some of that's going <coughs> to stay in the US and get used for sort of get sold to US government contracts under the Berry Amendment. Some of it's gonna get exported. Um, and the question of grade is really one of the primary tensions of the wool buy um, because a lot of the wool that's getting raised in the Navajo Nation is what's called churro or churro cross. And so the Navajo churro sheep is a breed of sheep with a very, very long and complex history, which I definitely don't have time to get into today, though I would love to. Um, but essentially sort of what has happened is that the Navajo churro is really well adapted to the demands of Navajo sort of pastoralism in life, but all of the characteristics that make um, that make it so well adapted to life with the Navajo really make it incompatible with the, with commercial production. And so what we have at the wool buy is this great tension between sort of the demands of this sort of like more traditional pastoral as, pastoralism with the standardized demands of like the commercial wool market, which are about sort of like the fiber length, the staple length, the color, um, and sort of various other elements of the churro and the churro cross. And so obviously there's different kind of like financial implications for sort of what type of wool people are raising. And so I think this is sort of a good moment to talk about sort of the money in the wool buy. And so while the wool buy has really significantly increases the, increased the prices paid to producers um, by bringing them into direct contact with buyers and taking out the middlemen of the trading posts, it's not really in any way offering a pathway towards a living earned through wool. Some people are leaving the wool buy with checks for $20, for $80, some checks are larger, but the reality of it is that you'll never really be able to make the time and labor input make sense in relation to the cash value of the wool material. And that's true nationally, this is not specific. Oh my God, okay, well, hard 20, thank you. Okay, well, thank you all very much. <laughs> Finish that sentence. You could oh. just finish that thought. Sure, sure, sure. Please. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, um, the notion that it's very hard to make a living. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, from wool. And that's <laughs> an issue that is not specific to the Navajo Nation situation, but is a global, or and in this case, national issue with, um, with wool, wool producers. Yeah, so Great. we'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. We know you have lots more to say, and if people are interested, they can contact Emily directly for more information. I'm going to ask the presenters to please sh um, sh um, share your videos again so we can see all of you. And I want to thank you for these very well researched and interesting presentations. Lynn, you're back. Good. <laughs> Thank you. There were several questions regarding this issue. Um, was part of the cheap labor in the area slaves? Did yeah, Roswell it's always, use slaves? always a question. And that's one of the things I'm doing more work on. There were definitely slaves in the area at this point in time. Um, I think that the majority of the slaves were not they might have been participating in the growth and the maybe the the um, picking of it. I don't see that any were working in the factories. I think those are all white people. Um, and a lot of the names that I see of the people who are who are sending the cotton to the mill have slaves. A lot of them have small numbers of slaves. It's something I'm working on. I, and remember, there weren't any after the Civil War, so it all been and the Civil War started in the 1860s. So um, it's kind of a, a way to say, I, I, probably, I don't know how many were, how many weren't. They were, the slaves were very expensive. And so we have a lot of photographs and photographs come into play of, of whites, if you will, and blacks and slaves working together. In the, I mean, it was kind of a community effort. Um, it's a loaded question. It's hard to get an answer to, and I'm working on it. Yeah. Great. I think there were a lot of um, viewers, uh, attendees, who were concerned that that was omitted from the presentation. And oh. so there were several comments and questions about it. Okay, well, I'll be sure to, to address that more in the paper, but it's really hard one to, very, very, very hard to quantify. Um, two of the presenters mentioned fiber sheds. Could they talk a little bit more about them? Thanks. One of them was Peggy, I know that. Okay, so um, if people aren't familiar with Fiber Shed, it's a movement that started in California and it's um, thinking about your clothing in the same way you think about um, living in a watershed and that you would then um, try to clothe yourself with fibers and processors that are working within that small, you know, local area rather than getting your clothes from halfway around the world. And there, the, um, there's a number of affiliate fiber sheds in the country, um, not in every state, but um, I'm involved with the one in Western Massachusetts and we're producing cloth. Great. Was and and the cloth, we got the wool, everything happened within a hundred miles of here, where we, we got wool from wool sheep farmers and it was carded, spun and woven. Um, Emily, were you the other person who mentioned fiber shed? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think Peggy just did a fabulous job of, of explaining the the concept in the system. And I think sort of, you know, I, I mentioned it in sort of the sense of that in when we think about sort of finding ways of talking about material traceability, that the fiber shed is one is one way. And then sort of illuminating the larger scale um, sort of industrial or semi-industrial supply chains is, is another way that I'm particularly interested in. Yeah. There was a chat response giving information to to Lynn that there were a lot of black women who were working in textile production post-Civil War. And I hope you will continue this research. If you don't know about the Black Crafts Archive, that would be a great nonprofit for you to connect with as you continue the work. Um, I saw it was Heather. Heather, can you um, connect with me through, uh, maybe Vita can tell you how to do that. And we can, we can talk about that. I'd love that. You can do that two ways, through the TSA um, members site or on the main page. There are place, there's a place to put messages 
And so you just have to press messages and look up Lynn Tinley and send her a message. In so, Campus, right? Yes, and I, I encourage you to continue yeah. to, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, Emily, um, there's two questions about churro sheep. Um, can you talk about a little about their history? And I heard older churro was different, including increased luster. Is there a possible demand by hand weavers who want higher quality churro wool? And do you know anything about this concept? Those were two different questions, but I put them together. I'll, I'll, smush, I'll do. I'll do my best. Yeah. So there's there's I think that sort of a couple of things. So I think that. You know, there are some people who say or who really think that sort of the the breeds, the Navajo churro, it is um, a complex history. And somebody in the chat mentioned Marsha Weisiger's book, um, which I'm familiar with and have read. And, you know, I, I didn't get too much into the history in this talk because that's, that's a whole thing unto itself. But sort of with the with this project overall, my hope is to use sort of the contemporary supply chain as a thread from which we can kind of like move back in time and forward in time and to understand these histories and how they relate to the materials and the processes themselves. So in terms of the churro specifically, um, yeah, I mean, I've heard opinions from people that sort of the churro as it's understood today and sort of defined by the like Livestock Conservancy's breed standards or the, or the Navajo Churro Sheep Association breed standards is a whole different animal than the churro that was raised, you know, 150 years ago by the Navajo. And I think that uh, to me, that sort of idea makes a lot of sense with the sort of notion that in the last hundred years, there's been huge um, dramatic reductions in the number of sheep from a number of angles, both from breed improvement and sort of like breed, just sort of genetic changes. And then also um, through uh, the livestock reduction programs that happened in the 1930s, where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Navajo livestock were killed by the um, US government and sort of a really poorly implemented um, sort of anti-erosion and sort of land preservation effort. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, there are a couple of suggestions and a question. Um, uh, those interested, Marilyn Roberts writes, those interested in slave labor can look at the book Plantation Slave Weavers, a compilation of oral histories from the Library of Congress by M. Madison. And someone else brings up, um, Sarah Kuhn brings up, I think it's also important to talk about the relationships to the forced removal of the Cherokee yeah. and how that may have enabled the creation of the Roswell Mill in that location. Well, it absolutely did. And that is uh, one of those um, things that I'll try to include in the paper. It's a big part of this story. It's a huge part of the story. It's a huge part of the settlement of Georgia in general. Um, and it should, it won't, it should not go un, unnoticed. It's very important. Yeah. I didn't highlight that, but it is, it is an important part of it. It was absolutely wouldn't have happened without that. Although I think you can tell that that the white the white people, if you will, were already you know taking it over and and um, so I, I and I realize there's a real ne obviously a very negative component of that, but there's it's also can be a very good story because like the Doris family that I mentioned, I mean there is a lot of intermarriage and interrelationship and interworking. The and I think that if the government hadn't come in, kind of forcefully remove them, everything might have been kind of okay. I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of romantically making that up. But it, it's a good story and a bad story in a lot of ways. Yeah. Not to be forgotten by, by any means. There's also a suggestion that I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong. Teyu Adissa Farrar recently gave a brilliant history of cotton to textile arts at the LA conference, especially in regard to the superior knowledge of African-American workers Re cotton cultivation and preparation. You should have forwarded that on to me. Um, I think um, Emily uh, from Shelley Mintz, beyond your scope of tracing the wool, you didn't say anything about the history of US government policy limiting Navajo ability to even own sheep. Great book by Marsha Weisiger, Dreaming of Sheep in Navajo Country. Have you spoken with any of the Navajos of this history? Yeah, that's a great question, Shelley. And sort of yes and no. I mean, like, I think with a 20 minute presentation, of course, it's hard to figure out sort of the whole scope of how to um, organize, organize this story. Um, 
But in terms of, um, you know, of course, like sort of just from a sort of procedural, unfortunate procedural perspective, my, you know, there's been some field work that has been obviously called off from by due to the coronavirus. Um, but I am sort of in conversation with um, some of the folks from Black Mesa about organ working with some of the oral histories that they've been collecting about sheep, um, sheep and sort of sheep's place in sheep and wool's place in sort of contemporary Diné life. So I think that figuring out sort of like how to how to sort of organize this story through the contemporary supply chain and understanding sort of the specificities of the history and then also kind of the way that the material moves into the global market is sort of that's sort of in many ways the hook that I'm that I'm hoping to follow, which obviously includes um, all participants. Yeah. Uh, there's a question for Lynn. Do you know if the Roswell Mill was part of the Southern Manufacturing Association probably around the end of the 19th century? I'm curious how the Southern factory owners coordinated and controlled pricing. Yeah, so I haven't done a ton of work on that. I believe they were members. I've seen reference to it. I'll take a look at that. Um, you know, the the, eight, the Roswell Manufacturing Company sold, and a lot of these um, companies did, their product through agents and commissions. And so they were really dictating the price there. Um, and I think that the mill owners tried to work very hard to obviously get the most they could from it. Whereas, you know, like if you look at the prices that it's being sold at in the North, it, they were kind of constrained by what they could get for it. And when you look at the board minute meeting minutes, there's this constant, there, to one degree, there's a constant discussion about, we it costs us so much to get it in, to pay for it, to get it in. And then we process it, we can only get it for this amount of money. Um, um, on the other hand, uh, there, there's a lot of discussion about the percentage of uh, dividends they were giving off as well. And so that's one of the things I'm an, an accountant. So I've gotten very interested in tracking that dividend trail because, you know, people heavily invested in this and they're getting some pretty significant dividends, particularly during the Civil War. And I'm thinking that part of that was part of that was just trying to get some of the money out of the company because, they could all, they were afraid they'd have nothing left at the end anyway. So during the Civil War, for dividends, for example, sometimes they're actually giving yarn instead of cash, because for one thing, no one wanted Confederate cash because of the value of it was questionable. But think about one of the things that is another interesting thing is like you say, in 20 minutes, you can only talk about so much. When I saw the image of the trucks and the wool in line, it kind of reminded me of the, the horse-drawn wagons with all that with all the bales of cotton on it and there's a there is some discussion and there's some letters at Yale that I need to go take a look at of people who are people, local people who are very disgruntled at the amount of money they're getting for their cotton and they're very verbal about it so there is another hidden story if you will about this constant play between the, you know, the wealthy and the poor and the producer and the, and the grower, you know, that kind of a thing going on, which I haven't even touched on. It's really very interesting. And I think there are two um, attendees who also want to address that and saying that, oh, hold on. The enslaved peoples or African-American peoples can include more than quantification. That's one statement. And then um, another person says, I think that your presentation came off as insensitive in some aspects, omitting slavery and referring to Native Americans as Indians. How do you plan on changing this in the future? Yeah, I thought about that. And I use the term Indian in the sense that if you, that's what the... Oops. But that's what they're called. They're called Indian treaties, and that's why I use that word. Um, and I tried. I don't intend to be insensitive, and I apologize um, at all. Um, so I, I just don't intend to. I really go back to the historical. That's what they were called. Um, so, with the terms in terms of quantum, um, I don't mean to just quantify. The issue is I can't be specific because I can't find out, I can't, it's hard to find names, it's hard to find what they were doing, who I, I'm having a hard time even knowing exactly who's giving how much, selling how much 
cotton to the mill. So I have to kind of try to go backwards. And really as a result of civil war is one of the reasons the records are very difficult to put together as I was saying. So, um, I, so I don't mean quantify in terms of not personalizing it. I'm saying personalizing it is becoming very, very hard to do. There's the WPA narratives, slave narratives. Yeah. yeah. So you comb through those, and then you would have names, and you know, it's a crapshoot as to whether you'd mm -hmm. find somebody that worked at Roswell or in the area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. This is the beginning of my research. And so I love hearing these ideas because there's so much out there. Um, and, the, and these are absolutely perfect places for me to go for information. Thank you. Peggy, the 1906 map of Massachusetts was illuminating, particularly in the narrative of Lowell textile mill production, moving to the South starting in the late 19th, 20th century. Obviously, the National Park Service in Lowell wouldn't exist without at least a few active mills in the third quarter of the 20th century. Was there a dramatic, in caps, drop off in textile? It, was there a dramatic drop off in textile mill production in Massachusetts after 1906, or were Massachusetts textile mills closely closed gradually over the course of the 20th century? That's from Jennifer Swope. That's a big question. Um, and I guess the, my answer is they closed gradually. There were any number of um, points at which mills closed. It tended to be more the cotton mills that went south rather than the woolen mills and the woolen mills hung on for quite a long time, especially through World War II because they were really instrumental in supplying the, um, the war effort and um, I work on Crompton and Knowles looms and I have this great slide that shows all the things that they made and it says it takes 10 sheep to clothe one soldier. Um, but I mean, within, they were, I worked in the last worsted mill in Massachusetts, probably in 1981 or so. So, um, they hung on for quite a, a while, much longer than you'd think, but you know, woolen mills tend to be more specialized. And so um, they were small, they were specialized. And if there was a niche for them, they existed. Someone's asking what the name of the woolen mill that you worked in in the 1980s was. It's Loretta Crippen. It was the Worcester Textile in um, Warwick, Rhode Island. There's a, just a couple of comments. I think the lecture on cotton can also reconsider the one image of a black woman was in reference to her coarse cotton work apron. I have to imagine that she didn't have a choice that she is wearing a work apron over a more gentle article of clothing. Probably, that's probably true, yeah. Um, for Peggy, leaving Casimir as, as a part of the fiber shed movement, how would you, your customers work with that yardage. It's from Leslie Armstrong. Well, it's um, finished and ready to go. So just as you would work with um, any, any wool that you bought from a fabric store. Hmm. Um, I think this is for Lynn. It's um, from Heather Powers. You're doing great work, just keep going. A lot of those records are not in the typical archives and many are not kept at all, but Black Craftspeople DA might be able to help with your research methods. So appreciate this, Black Craftspeople. That's what was mentioned earlier, right? Yeah. Okay, please get a hold of me and I just really love that. It's, um, yeah, it's kind of funny when you do this kind of work, it takes so much time and you can go down one road, know this other stuff is going on and you keep going down, down that road instead of shifting over to another topic. And the information is very, very hard to find. It's, it's um, but it's, it's, I think it's findable, but it's hard to find. Yeah. So I appreciate your interest. I'm gonna pull this to a close of the final comment and question for Emily. And that is, uh, Emily, thank you for introducing, it's from Leigh Wishner. Thank you for introducing me to Stali Brass, semi-embarrassed, but I've never heard of this essay. 
I've looked it up and plan to read it. That second quote you shared really speaks to the heart of what all decorative arts suffer from in the realm of materialism. Mm. And there's a question here from Sarah Kuhn. Emily, the Navajo raised churro for cultural reasons. It is the sheep brought by the Spanish that caused them to become pastoralists. They are trying to restore the heritage breed after a government oh. eradication program. I hope we can help to create a market of educated consumers so that raising churro also generates income. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think that for me in this project, what I've, what I've sort of, the arc that I've traveled is when I first started working with this, my understanding or my, my hope was that as a weaver who was working with this um, churro and churro blended yarns that we could do exactly that, could help sort of create a market. Um, what I've realized is that sort of the, monster of the global wool market is pretty huge, you know, and sort of the limitations make it actually quite difficult to, um, to sort of incorporate churro as such. And so for me, part of this project is really about kind of trying to do the work of illuminating all the processes. And so that hopefully sort of, if not sort of creating a market for churro, that potentially kind of just bringing light and in some, in some sense to sort of some of the intricacies of it can, um, uh, contribute to that sort of, you know, movement. And I'm going to leave, let the final word go to an audience member. It's from Susan Strawn. And she says her PhD dissertation, Restoring Navajo Churro Sheep, oh. community-based influences on a traditional fiber resource and textiles in 2004, focuses on interviews and history in a study of the Navajo Lifeway. I published a synopsis in Textile, the Journal of Cloth and Culture. So you might want to reference that information. I do. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you to the presenters. This was a really excellent session. And I thank all the audience members for their excellent comments, criticisms, and suggestions. And um, I'm going to, with that, I'm going to bring this session to a close and hope you enjoy the rest of your sessions during the symposium. And I apologize for Emily's and my dog. In my apologies, I really thank you. My <laughs> thank you, thank you, Bye, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.